Okay, let us begin uh, the second part of, of this uh, seminar session. So uh, now we have uh, Professor Mari Esteban, who will be presented by Professor Enrique Fernandez Clara. So Enrique, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, this is a very, very, very great pleasure for me to present uh, Maria Jesus. That is uh, a colleague and uh, overall a great friend of me. I know her uh, since many years. And in fact, she doesn't need uh, really a presentation because she's uh, very well known uh, for many reasons. Uh, of course, one of them is for her work and as research director in CNRS and University of Paris Dauphine in Paris in France. Uh, on nonlinear PDEs for uh, problems coming from physics and chemistry, but also because she has been, uh, among other things, the director of the CNRS uh, laboratory, Serenat, uh, during several years, and then president of ICIAM, uh, the International Council for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. She has been a member of, she is a member of several uh, science academies in Europe and also Dr. Norris Causa of several universities in Spain. So, uh, uh, as I said, uh, no need for presentation. So it's a great pleasure uh, for me to announce uh, her talk uh, entitled Quantitative Stability Estimates for Some Functional Inequalities. In, uh, now it's, uh, it's you, uh, your talk uh, for us. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you, Enrique, for this very nice uh, presentation. So uh, my talk has something in common, in common with the, that of uh, Xavier, because uh, my work is also in collaboration, partly with Alessio Figali. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm going to speak about quantitative stability estimates for some functional inequalities. I will explain what it means in a moment. And this is a very recent uh, work in collaboration with Jean Dolbo, Alessio Figali, Rupert Frank, and Michael Loss. So let's start with the Sobolev inequality. Sobolev inequality is, uh, I suppose, is uh, very well known for everybody, but let me go quickly through it. So Sobolev inequality says that when you are in Rd and D is larger than or equal to three, and uh, two star is the so-called critical Sobolev exponent, which is 2D divided by D minus two, then you have this inequality, which says that the L2 norm of the gradient of F square controls from is controlled from below by, some, by a constant, positive constant ST times the L2 star norm square of F, and this for every f, which is in h.1 of rd, h1 dot is the homogeneous h1 sobre the space, which means the functions, basically. It means the functions for which uh, the gradient is in L2. OK, so this is the very well-known Sobolev inequality. With, and then let's uh, say that uh, in this inequality, we have equality only on the manifold M of the so-called Ovantalenti functions, which are here. So G of A equal to this expression. Okay, so we have several um, free parameters. A and C are scalar parameters, and B is a vector parameter. And so we have D plus two parameters. So we have these functions, which are the ones, the only ones for which we have equality in this inequality, okay? Now we know that uh, we know the expression of the best constant. The best constant is uh, ST, which is uh, this expression here, is the sharp Sobolev constant. And um, uh, just for history, let's say that uh, the first time that um, uh, this information about some information about the optimizers, about the, the optimal constant, were given was in a talk by Rodenich in '66. Uh, he didn't write the paper, but somebody had notes on that on that talk. Then there was a paper by Rosen in 71, and then the final work on this inequality was done by independently by Oban uh, and Talenti in 76. 
So um, this inequality is very, uh, I suppose you all know it, but is very useful in many fields of mathematics, not only in analysis, uh, PDEs, but also in differential geometry, in uh, convex analysis in large dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really an inequality that is very, also in probability, is, is very useful in many areas of mathematics. Okay, so now let's go to the stability issue. I'm um, oh no, sorry. I just want to say that because I will use it, it, it will appear in the in the afterwards. Is that by using the inverse of the stereographic projection from RD into SD, we can write sobre inequality in this way here um, on the sphere, on the unit sphere SD. Okay, so sometimes you will see it written in RD, sometimes in SD they are equivalent. Okay, now. Um, um, the question of stability is the following. Look at the what we call the deficit of Sobolev, so delta F, which I define as the difference of the two terms in the inequality. Okay, so this term minus this term. Since we have Sobolev inequality, we know that this quantity, this deficit, is non-negative. Okay, that's Sobolev inequality. Now, in 85, Brezis and Leaf asked the question. They said, is there a link? between the, uh, how to say, this quantity, how big this quantity is, and the distance of the function f to the manifold m, to the manifold of the optimizers of the open, of lengthy functions, okay? So if this quantity is a small, is the function f going to be close to m or not or what? So they ask this question and almost immediately there was an answer of Pierre Williams the same year, who, say, who proved that indeed, if the deficit, if this quantity is a small, then necessarily the function f will be close to the manifold. But this was a totally qualitative result. Some years later, six years later, Bianchi and Egnell proved something more quantitative. What they did was to prove that in all dimensions larger than or equal to three, there is a constant c, b, e, b for Bianchi and Egnell. Okay, there is a constant which is positive, less than or equal than four divided by d plus four, such that we have the following inequality. In the numerator here, we have the deficit, so we have deficit. And in the denominator, what we have is the distance of f to the manifold to the square. Okay, so we, what we measure is how big is this quotient how big the deficit is with respect to, to the distance square or f to the manifold. And what they prove, proved is that there is a constant, positive constant, such that this, this uh, quotient is always larger than CPE. Okay, so they quantified a little bit the result of Lyons, but without saying what the constant was, nothing at all. The only thing no, that they, they proved is that it was positive and less than this number. Okay, so um, um, a very recent result, actually two months old in December, Tobias Koenig proved that this constant, the best constant in this inequality is achieved indeed by some function f and that the constant is strictly less than four divided by d plus four. Okay, so Koenig proved this. So he gave an extra information about uh, this result of Jan Kiekner. And what we have done very recently, also last December, is the following. We have proved the theorem which says the following. There is a constant beta, positive, but now it's not just any constant, it's a positive uh, constant, sorry, for which we have an explicit lower estimate, which doesn't depend on d, on the dimension d, such that for all dimensions and all f's in this space, we have this improved Sobolev inequality. We have that the deficit of Sobolev is bounded below by beta divided by d times the distance of f to the manifold to the square. Okay, so what we have done is to quantify the constant of um, bianchi Eknel. We have said that there is a constant that we can compute explicitly so that the best constant is bounded below by beta divided by d. Okay, so this is the first time that this constant has been uh, 
explicitly quantified. So uh, also let me say that this uh, coefficient here, this um, beta divided by d, is optimal. So the, the, in the sense that the, the decay when d goes to infinity of the best constant is like one over d, okay? So it's like something over d. So the corollary now is that the best constant in the inequality is strictly less, less, less than four divided by d plus four. This is Koenig's result. And our result says that it is bounded below by beta divided by d with, I insist, a constant beta that we can explicitly compute. Now comments um, about this stability inequality uh, is that first, the square here in the distance is optimal. We can't do better than this square, okay? Second, I want to comment on the strategy of Jan Kieknel, the proof. The strategy of Jan Kieknel was the following. First, they used the spectral analysis argument to see, to deal with the functions f, which are very near the manifold f, okay? So they treated separately the case of functions that are very near to the Obantal entity functions and functions that are far away. Okay, so on the on nearby, they use a spectral analysis. And then to deal with functions that are very far away from the manifold, what they did was to use the concentration compactness method of Pierre Williams to reduce the global estimate to the local estimate. Okay, so they, they use a compactness argument to deal with the functions that are far away. That's why they couldn't give a good estimate. I mean, they couldn't give any estimate for the constant because the proof was by a compactness argument. So the only thing they could say is there exists a positive constant. Okay, now this idea of Jan Kieknel has been used in many, has been applied to many of the problems in calculus of variations. And actually, if you look for Jan Kieknel in uh, Matsainet, you will see that they, are, they have lots of uh, citations because there's been a lot of works using this technique to apply to proof stability estimates for other inequalities, also for Sobolev in, in geometrical context, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I insist because they used a compactness argument, the constant CB couldn't be quantified. They could, couldn't be, there was no explicit anything about it, okay? So in order to prove our theorem, our strategy is the following. What we do is we take the second step of the proof of Jan Kieknel. We don't use concentration compactness. And what we do is we um, give a constructive proof for this second step. So we can deal with functions that are far away from the manifold and reduce their behavior of the behavior of the constant for them to the ones of which are near the manifold, but do, we do it in a constructive way. That's why we can keep track of the best constant. And then also in, for the first step of the proof of Bianchi Eknel, we do some spectral analysis, but more, more refined than the one they do. Okay, so this is the basic strategy that we use. Now I'm going to explain a little bit some ideas about the proof. So the proof is divided into several steps. First, we deal with the case of non-negative functions f that are close to the manifold. We use some argument to deal with them. Then we use another argument to deal with the non-negative functions that are far away from the manifold. And here is when we link the two of them by a construction, explicit construction. And then we deal with the functions which change sign by using a very simple, I will explain later, a very simple concavity argument, okay? So we have these three steps in the proof, and in each of them, there are different analytical arguments. And uh, let me say that the fact that we have two theorems, actually, one in which we have an estimate, explicit estimate for the best constant, and that's not too, too difficult. I mean, it's technical, but not too technical. And then we have a second theorem in which we really estimate that we see that the best constant decays at as one over d when d goes to infinity. And this is very important. It's not enough to say that we have a lower estimate, but to have the decay like one over d 
is extremely important for applications. Okay, but this part requires a much more refined analysis and a lot of very complicated estimates. Now, let me start with the easier result, let's say. The easier result says the following. If we consider, we call E of F, the quotient that we want to estimate from below, okay? Now, we are going to define several numbers. We take D less than or equal to three. We define Q, Q is just two star, but just to make the notations easier, I call it Q. And then I define for every delta positive, I define nu of delta as the square root of delta divided by one minus delta. These are just definitions for the statement of the proof of the theorem. So what we prove is that for no, all non-negative functions, we have an estimate, a lower estimate, explicit, which is less than, uh, this one half is a mistake, less than the supremum of delta mu of delta for all, all delta between zero and one. And mu of delta is a function that is bounded below by something that is explicit. You see here the explicit expressions for m of nu depending and the expressions depend on the dimension. We have different proofs in dimension three, in dimension four and five, and for larger dimensions. So you see here that we have a lower estimate that is explicit because everything in this statement is explicit. The mu is explicitly bounded below by something that I write down for you, so you have it explicitly there. So this result is quite nice and we're very happy when we proved it because it was the first time that a quantitative, a totally explicit quantitative stability estimate was proved. So we're very happy with this. But then we observed that this estimate from below is actually, okay, it's an estimate, but it's very small for large D. When we take very large dimensions D, this estimate is exponentially decreasing to zero. So it's good. We have an explicit estimate, but it's extremely small for large dimensions. And we were interested in something better, okay? So uh, we're happy, but half happy. And then we try to see if we could improve this theorem and go to an estimate that would be better for large dimensions. Okay, so that's what I'm going to explain now. So um, let me give some ideas about the proof of this theorem, and then I will say what we do to prove the more refined theorem. So first, we start with local estimates. What we do is to look at the deficit of uh, Sobolev. So this is the deficit of Sobolev written um, on the sphere. And we prove that this is less than or equal a constant, m of nu times the integral of radiant r, r squared, and m of mu is explicit, so it's written here, okay? So we start with estimates for functions which are small, I'm sorry, that are close to the manifold. And I forgot to write that r is the difference of f and a noventa lenti. So it's the difference, it's the distance to the, if f minus u, when u is a noventa lenti function, so r is a little bit the difference, okay? So saying that the norm LQ of r is small, is saying that in LQ, the function f is close to the manifold. So we pr first prove this estimate for functions that are near the, um, the manifold. And then how we do it very quickly. What we do is just to obtain, to use this kind of, uh, of estimates, we have two functions, u and r. You take the sum, you look at the LQ norm square, and you try to uh, estimate them from above as best as you can. And for that, what you have to do is to use Taylor expansion, which is a little bit, uh, uh, not just the, the usual, usual um, uh, Taylor expansion. You have to do it with care and try to have as, 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 as a better estimate as you can, okay? By doing that, what you do then is the following. Um, you look at the deficit here. You look at the deficit of Sobolev you estimate from below by some difference, and then we use uh, the, the, this proposition here on the top to estimate this LQ of U to the two minus Q in the best possible way. And by doing that, we obtain the proposition that I stated before, okay? So what I am saying is that, um, sorry, that this 
so this proposition is proved by using a very delicate Taylor expansion, let's say, okay, for functions that are close to the manifold. Okay, now what do we do for functions that are far away? For functions that are far away, we are going to follow uh, the following uh, strategy. We are going to divide the, the space of functions into two regions. For every delta, which is positive, we are going to consider first the functions f so that the distance to the manifold square is less than delta times the L2 norm of the gradient square. Okay? So first we look at functions f, we satisfy this inequality, and we look at the quotient E of f, and we call mu of delta the infimum of all those. Once we call that, we will see how to estimate it later. What we do next is the following thing. We use an idea that we um, uh, got by reading a paper of Christ in 2017 in another context. But Christ did the following thing that well, we adapt his idea here. What we do is the following. For functions that are far away, so for functions so that the distance is larger than delta times the L2 norm of the gradient square. So we are in the complement of this set here, okay? What we do is try to make a flow, so they are far away. What we do is to try to create a flow that takes them closer to the manifold, okay? So we are far, okay, we are going to take you and we are going to translate you following a flow, okay, a trajectory, to take you down near to the to the to the manifold. So the idea is to build a flow f tau, which does the following: for tau equal to zero, we say that f zero is f. Okay. Now we construct a flow that conserves the L two star norm. So when we go go along the flow, the L two star norm is constant, and so that it decreases the L two norm of the gradient. Okay. And moreover, it will do the following. If we take tau going to infinity, the distance of f tau to the manifold will tend to zero. So this says that the flow is indeed taking a function f and is going to take it and it's going to approach and approach the manifold until it approaches totally because the limit is equal to zero. Okay? So this is the idea that we got from the paper of Christ in 2017. I will say later how we construct this flow. Now imagine that we have this flow and then we approach, we approach, we approach. And since we are approaching, at some point for some tau, we started with the distance being larger than delta times this. But now since we are going to approach, at some point we are going to reach that we have equality because we are going to zero. So, so at some point we are going to cross the moment when the, the distance square is exactly equal to delta times the L2 norm of the gradient square at the time tau equal to tau zero. Okay, we do that. If we do that, then we are done. Why? Because then we look at the quotient EF, we see easily that is bounded below by this. Now we write this quotient, we divide by this gradient, so we have one minus SD times this. Now, in this quotient here, in the numerator, we have something that is going to be constant by the flow. And in the denominator, we have something that is decaying with the flow. But decaying in the denominator with a minus sign in front, okay? So what we have is that this difference here is bounded below by the quotient E of F for the function F tau zero. But now we use the property that for tau zero, we have this equality. We have made this assumption. And then we can use this here and see that this guy is equal to this thing, which is equal to delta E of F tau zero. But F tau zero now lives in the set of that we, I defined before. But before I looked at the functions for which this distance square was less than or equal delta times the gradient square, okay? So when I have equal, I am in this set. So if I am in this set, this delta E of F tau zero is larger than or equal delta times mu of delta, 
Okay, so at the moment when I approach well enough, I can use the estimate I get for functions which are near the manifold. So this looks very appealing and very easy, but here there is a, a big but. The problem is that we don't, we can't we are not sure we can find theta tau zero. Why? Because this flow that we are going to construct is not continuous in the H1 norm. It's continuous in the LP norm, in the LQ norm, but not in the H1 norm, okay? So we don't have, we know that we are going to approach, but we can have jumps. And so we are not sure that we are going to, um, to have such a tau zero. So the idea is this, but we have to work more because we don't have continuity for the flow in H1. Now, let me um, say very quickly how we construct the flow. So the flow is based in uh, some ideas that come from uh, all works of Carlin and Loss in 1990. It's a technique that is called competing symmetries and which is the following. First, we take a function f defined on the sphere sd plus one and we make a conformal rotation like this, okay? Now we write what this conformal rotation means in S in uh, RD by stereographic projection, for example. So we look at the image in RD of this uh, conformal rotation. And you have a very uh, complicated expression, but it is what it is. What are the properties of this um, function U? The properties is that the E of UF is equal to E of F. And also, the LP norms are, con are, are the same, and the uh, L2 norm of the gradient of UF is less than what the, the one of F, okay? So the U is easily to be studied and is uh, a very well-known object in geometry, so this does this. And then what we did was the following, which to consider a symmetric decreasing rearrangement for every function F, which is non-negative, we consider a symmetric decrease in classical rearrangement so that it keeps the LQ norm constant and it decreases the L2 norm of the gradient, okay? Now, by using these two guys, what we did was the following. We are going to use a result of Carlin and Loss of 1990, which says the following. Take a function F in L2 star, which is non-negative. And now consider the sequence Fn, which is constructed as this. You take F, you apply U, the conformal rotation, then you do the symmetric rearrangement, and you iterate this. So you apply it once and again and again and again and again, this, this operation, okay? Then what they proved, and this is a very strong result, they proved that then the functions Fn converts in L2 star to HF, where HF is what? HF is G star, which is this function here, which is an Ovantal MD function, times the L2 star norm of F, okay? So what they see is that this sequence of functions have the nice property that when you tend N to infinity, you approach an Ovantal MD function, okay? When you start for, from any function f which is non-negative, you iterate this procedure, and at the limit, you will approach an Ovantal MD function, okay? And you do it in a way so that the, the gradients, the L2 norms of the gradient are decreasing, and the L2 star of the functions are constant, okay? Now, there are some properties, some nice properties um, that come from in the result of Carrel and Laws that we can apply to our result. Well, it's not important, it's technical results, okay, but that are useful in our proof. And now we are going to, 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 to explain the rest of the, the strategy. We take any function f, which is non negative. We are going to consider this far away from the manifold in the sense that the distance square is less than delta times gradient f in L2 square, okay? We take, so we are far from the manifold. Now we are going to apply this flow that is based on competing symmetry, et cetera, that I described before. So there are two alternatives. 
either the distance is always larger than delta gradient fn, or there is an n0 so that we cross. So before we are larger than delta, and then we are at some step less than delta. Okay? So there are two alternatives. Either we are always larger than delta, or at some point we cross. And for the two cases, we have to use different arguments. This is very technical. I wrote here something down, but I am not going to, um, to explain the details in this talk. So the case which is easier to do is the case A, in which we use the previous lemmas that I stated without um, describing them. So the case A is relatively easy to deal with. And for the case B, the case in which we cross, I mean, we, we jump over the equality case, then we need something of continuous flow. We need something there. And what we do is we use another rearrangement that is due to Brock and that allows us to cross in a continuous manner at the level equal to delta. Okay, so I, I will not go into more details because it's very technical. But so there are many cases to be dealt with, but in the end, we managed to, to deal with all the cases. Okay. And, uh, and so we can, with these all cases, what we do is to prove the result for positive functions. Now we want to deal with the case of any function, if not necessarily positive. And why up to now we have to deal with positive functions? because the continuous rearrangements function only for positive functions. So we didn't know how to manage for functions that change sign. But for functions that change sign, we are going to use a very simple concavity argument, which is the following. Let's look at the stability estimate. And now let's call CBE positive, the one that we have for positive functions. So if we have positive functions, we know that there is a, a constant here, which is that we call CBE positive. Now, what happens if F is not positive? Well, in that case, what we do is the following. We take U, we consider by, I mean, we can, um, no, uh, we can normalize it. We normalize the L2 star norm equal to one. And we call M, the L2 star norm is square, uh, the, 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 the integral of U minus, of the negative part. So we have a positive part of U, a negative part, okay? So we call M this uh, integral of the negative part, and of course, the positive part will be one minus M, the integral, okay? We have these two pieces. What can we do? Then it's a very simple argument. It's so simple. We, we needed a long time to, to, prove, to think about it. We'll consider the function hm, which is m to this power, plus one minus m to the, the same power, minus one. You can see very easily that this function is concave. And we use the concavity to prove that for every m, you have this inequality. Just concavity, not very simple. And then using this, you can see very easily, it's really a, an easy calculation, two, three lines, that the deficit of U, you can separate the pieces corresponding to the positive part and the negative part. And by putting them together, what you see is an, in the end, the optimal constant is larger than or equal one half of the, the optimal constant for the positive functions. Okay, so first you get base constant for the positive functions. And then by this concavity argument, you get, um, you get an estimate for all functions. So you see it's, this argument is quite easy. Okay, so with this, we have proved the first theorem in which we obtain a lower estimate for the stability constant, explicit, but as I said before, very bad, very bad for last dimensions. It's exponentially decreasing when d goes to infinity. So we were happy, as I said before, but half happy. Now I'm going to tell you quickly how we managed to get a better estimate, how we managed to get an estimate that is not exponentially, exponentially decaying, but with the case as a constant times d, which is much better, okay? So uh, how we do it? 
Well, what we do is go back to the Taylor expansions and try to do Taylor expansions which are much, 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 much more, uh, much better. And how we do it? What we do is consider a function R and look at this, at, we start expanding one plus R to the Q. So you start expanding Taylor expansion. The first term for R small is one, then you have QR and then you have the rest. And the rest we want to, to, to compute and to estimate very, very much in detail. And what we do to do that? What we do is to separate, to write R as the sum of R1 plus R2 plus R3. And what are these R's? R1 is the minimum of R and some constant gamma. So it's the part of R that is below gamma. R3 is the part of R which is above M. So we are going to take a gamma, small, and M large, and then R2 is going to be the thing in the middle, okay? So what we do is to make a cutoff of the function R in L infinity. And we look at the part of R, which is small, the part of R, of R, which is intermediate, and the part of R that is large. Why we do it? Because we are going to use different arguments for the three different zones. So now we define tau, which is in the number four divided by d minus two. And what we do is prove a Taylor expansion, I mean, an estimate for the Taylor expansion that uses different arguments for the pieces R1, R2, and R3. And this is the, the estimate. The estimate tells you that one plus R to the Q minus one minus QR is bounded above by this horrible looking, horribly looking expression. And you have in some pieces, you have R1, R2, R3, but it's the best we have been able to do. And we have some constants, C that depend on M, on M bar. I mean, we have all kinds of constants, but every constant is computed, is computable. We, we can have explicit functions, explicit constants here. So we do this, and by using this Taylor expansion in full detail for the three pieces, what do, the, what do we do next is to look at the Sobolev deficit, and we see by using that expansion before that it is larger than some constant that behaves like one over d at infinity times this integral plus the sum of three disgusting terms that are written here. So some complicated terms, okay? We are happy because here this constant that we get behaves like one over d. So it's not exponentially decaying. It's much, much better when d is large. But in order to keep this joy of getting this behavior, we need to deal with this IK that are written here. And now I am not going to tell you much about this. The only thing is that I'm going to tell you that we are going to prove that the three guys are non-negative. For I1, we will use spectral gas, uh, gap estimates. For I3, we use Sobolev inequality. And we, for U2, we use uh, an improved spectral gap inequality. So we use different arguments for the three pieces that come from R1, R2, R3. So in the end, we are able to prove that this sum of IK is non-negative. And what we have finally is that the Sobolev deficit is bounded from below by this thing times a constant that we are very happy behaves like a constant divided by D when D is very large, okay? And when we had this, we knew that we could get and prove our theorem. Okay, our best theorem is saying that the best constant is of the kind beta over D when beta is um, an explicit function. Okay, so, uh, so this is the theorem that we have proved. Okay, so now let me use the remaining minutes to say why, why we were so happy with this result. No, I'm going to stay here. So the result that says that the best constant here is behaves like one over D at infinity. Well, we're looking for it. Why? Because we knew that we were able to prove such an estimate for the best constant, then we would be able to do nice things with passing to the limit when D goes to infinity. 
And the nice things are concerned with the so-called logarithmic Sobolev inequality that maybe you know, or maybe not, which says the following. The uh, Gaussian logarithmic uh, Sobolev inequality says that if you look at the integral of gradient V square with respect to a measure which is a Gaussian, like this. And then we, you can bound this from below by pi times the integral of a function, which is V squared time logarithm of V squared divided, normalized. Okay, so this is the so-called logarithmic Sobolev inequality. And this inequality is as famous and as important as the Sobolev inequality, and probably even more important because it plays um, a very important role, for example, in convex analysis, in large dimensions and probability, etc. So this inequality, again, is quite uh, important in various fields of math. Okay, so Carlen in 91 proved that this inequality was true with the best constant pi and the equality holds if and only if V is equal to this exponential. Okay, good. Now, when we proved for Sobolev, the theorem before, the theorem that the best constant for the stability of Sobolev was of the type constant divided by D, we knew formally that we could use it to pass to the limit when D goes to infinity and get a stability result for this Gaussian logarithmic Sobolev inequality. Okay, so I'm going to tell you how it works very quickly. So what we prove, this is our second main result, is that when we look at the difference of the two terms in the Gaussian logarithmic Sobolev inequality, the difference is not only non-negative, but can be bound below by a constant kappa positive times the distance of P to the manifold of the corresponding Ovantalenti, it's not Ovantalenti now, but the guys which are optimizers for this inequality. So we have the same kind of stability result. And again, the constant K can be computed explicitly. So again, we have an explicit quantitative stability result for logs of inequality. And I can tell you that this is really this is um, a very, very good result. Many people have been looking for this result for years. And they were, for example, um, a result showing that if you have a different Sobolev inequality, you couldn't have stability and all kinds of things. So there is a lot of literature about all of this. So this is the first quantitative stability result for log sub inequality. How we prove it? Well, what we do is to use the previous stability result for Sobolev. I state it again, okay? And the important thing is that the best constant in the stability for Sobolev is of the kind beta d divided by d. Beta depends on d, but, but uh, is bounded below. So we know that there exists a beta star, so that the lim inf when d goes to infinity is strictly positive. This is the main important message from the first part of my talk, okay? And then one, what does is the following. One writes the, um, this, this stability for Sobolev in the following manner. One looks at functions u, which are equal to f divided by g star. And g star is the one talent, this one talent function. So we rewrite this inequality in a manner that is going to be nice to pass to the limit when d goes to infinity. So we do this, we rewrite this inequality in this manner. Okay, now we do something else. We do some scaling and scaling of the function. Uh, well, the constant here is not important, which is important is the square root of t. So we make a scaling. And then after computations, we find the following thing. We find this inequality here. So this is an easy consequence of the stability for Sobolev. But now we are ready to pass to the limit. And when I'm, I say we are ready to pass to the limit, what I can say is the following. Rd goes to infinity when d goes to infinity. So when you look at this inequality here, you can pass to the limit and you can, um, I, I am not explaining it well, but uh, what you do is that actually you take functions that uh, depend only on n variables, okay? Even if d is very, very large. 
So what you are going to do is you are going to pass to the limit. This guy is going to go to zero because Rd goes to infinity. So one over Rd squared goes to zero. So you get in the limit an integral of gradient V squared, and V is going to depend only on n variables. Then on the right hand side, you have something which is interesting, which is a constant times d minus two times the difference of these two integrals plus beta d, et cetera, et cetera. And what is the interesting thing now? The interesting thing, which is very well known for people who work with logarithmic sobolev inequalities, is that when d goes to infinity, the difference of these two integrals here converges to the integral of v squared log of p squared divided by its norm. Okay? So when we pass to the limit, this guy, which is here, okay, is going to converge to this, to this, um, to this integral, which is here, okay? To this, the integral of p squared times the logarithm of p squared normalized in omel two. Okay. And now what is the nice thing? The nice thing that, sorry, I come back here, is that this we know how to pass to the limit. The first one we know how to pass to the limit. And in the last term, what is the beauty of it? The beauty of it is that the, the integral of gradient v squared is non-negative. So we are going to throw it. And then what we see, and this is the beauty, is that the constant here behaves like constant, positive constant divided by d. And inside, what you have is d minus two. So when you pass to the limit, d minus two divided by d converges to one when d goes to infinity. And by passing to the limit, you get the result that I told you before. So when you pass to the limit here, the beta is going to be uh, bounded below by some beta star. The d is in the denominator. Here you have d minus two in the numerator. So you can pass to the limit. And what you get in the end is that the um, deficit of log sub inequality is bounded below by the infimo of beta d, which I called before beta star, times pi. The pi comes from here. And then the d minus 2 divided by d converges to 1. And so we get the stability, the quantitative explicit stability result for the Gaussian logarithmic uh, Sobolev inequality. And you see how important it was to have in the stability for Sobolev constant divided by d, because constant divided by d multiplied by constant d minus 2 has a limit which is a positive constant. In our first theorem, we had a constant here which was exponentially decaying when d goes to infinity. So exponentially decaying multiplied by d goes to 0. So with that first result for Sobolev, we wouldn't have been able to prove stability for log sob. But since we managed to improve our best constant for the stability of Sobolev and have something that behaved like a constant divided by d, now the d in the denominator divided by d minus 2 converges to 1. And beautifully, we can pass to the limit. I mean, there is a lot of technicalities, but the idea is this. You can pass to the limit and you get an explicit stability result for uh, log sub inequality. And with that, I uh, end my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice talk. And uh, now- it's a, little, have... it's a little bit technical, but it's, I think, a very important result, so I wanted to, to present it. Of course. Uh... Uh, we have some time for for questions. If, uh, is there any question? You can use the chat if you if you prefer to to make a question. Okay, I uh, I have uh, well I I I'm going to have. I'm going to ask a question. I know that this is not the, I understand that this is not the, the objective or the goal of the, of the talk, but uh, uh, you are always assuming that D is uh, greater, than, greater or equal than C. So uh, is there any, uh, any fine, any sharp result for D equal to two? Uh, 
I mean, uh, if you have, uh, uh, you have, to, I know you have to use uh, an embedding uh, theorem of the kind of Trudinger uh, inequality with exponential and all this, because you have uh, that H1 is uh, in all LP for fine P, but uh, once you use, uh, uh, that space is there any uh, estimate for the for the reminder? Yeah, so we haven't done it. Indeed, in dimension two, what replaces Sobolev inequalities, there are two inequalities: either moser trudinger or there is another one which is probably more interesting geometrically, which is called Onofre inequality. It's possible that we will be able to do it for those inequalities in dimension two, but uh, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, this is uh, we have proved this in December, so it's very very recent. And uh, maybe, but probably, I mean, the proof will have to be changed uh, in a very important manner. But we have an idea of how to deal now with this, with this, um, with this okay. inequalities, with this stability, stab stability estimates. So it's possible, but uh, not done yet. Uh, and, and also another question is. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the as an application, as an application of the result, uh, uh, I, I don't understand what you what do you have in mind to take uh, the uh, as large as possible. Which is the is there any kind of a limit problem uh, uh, to study with this uh, with this technique? I mean. Uh, is there any problem for which uh, you are considering approximations as the goal to infinity and you get something? Uh, no, our main, our main goal was to prove the stability for log sub because, because it's, it's, um, if we wanted to stop with Sobolev, we had enough with the first theorem we proved. Right? It was the constant was uh, small, but well, okay. But then we wanted to pass to the limit because it's when you pass to the limit from Sobolev, the infinity that you go to log sub. So in order to be able to, to get something at the end, we needed a constant that was not uh, smaller than one divided by D. Otherwise you lose, you lose because you see, you have a constant here, which is smaller than that goes to, to, um, to, um, to, um, to zero, uh, yeah. quicker than one over D. Then when you multiply by d minus two, uh, the constant yeah, will go yeah. to zero and you don't get any stability for Sobolev. Yeah. So our goal was to be able to pass from the stability of Sobolev to the stability for log Sov at a very low cost. What I mean is that we don't have to reprove all the all these technical you know, estimates and things. It's just passing to the limit in a not too complicated manner. Okay? So it was very important to have that the best constant was of this kind. Of course. Yes. And we know that it's optimal, by the way, because we knew that the best constant was less than four divided by d plus four. So we knew that the optimal behavior when d goes to infinity is like constant divided by d. So this, uh, what we have proved, is the best you can prove. Of course. As and it's enough to pass to the limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And well, is there any other question or comment or something to say? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to 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 we are going to, to to stop here. So thank you very much for your talk and uh, uh, thank you to everybody for uh, attending this uh, meeting. So uh, uh, see you uh, in a couple of weeks or something like this. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Ren